My name is John Steele, the University of New South Wales, and this is another in my series of videos on complex analysis. In these videos, we're going to be looking at singularities, where an otherwise analytic function fails to be analytic. Uh, in these videos, I'm only going to be looking at what we call isolated singularities, so none of the branch cuts and branch points that we met in the case of complex logarithms. A uh, singularity is isolated if a function f is not analytic at the point, but it is analytic in some neighbourhood at that point. To begin with, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, zeros uh, of analytic functions and their close relative, uh, the pole. So here we have a result, a definition. If f is analytic on some disk z minus z not less than r, and we write the function as a power series, and the first term this non-zero term has a power uh, k here, this term a k is not zero, then we refer to z naught as a zero of order k. So when the first non-zero term is k, power k, that's a zero of order k. On the other hand, if we've got an analytic function on a punctured disk, so zero less than z minus z naught less than r, which means from Laurent's theorem we can write it in terms of Laurent's series, and suppose the series looks like this, it begins, well, the lowest power is uh, bp over z minus z naught to the p, and so on to higher powers, then we refer to z naught as a pole of order p. So zero of order k series begins at z to the k, pole of order p series begins basically at one over z minus z naught to the p. Now, in order to detect zeros and poles, we use the results I've got on the other half of the whiteboard here. If uh, z naught is a zero of order k for a function f if and only if the function vanishes at the point z naught. so does its first derivative. In fact, its first k minus 1 derivatives all vanish, but the k derivative does not. If you remember Taylor's theorem, the coefficients of the power series are just multiples of the derivative, so that's an easy thing to prove. On the other hand, z naught's a pole of order p for f, if when we multiply through by z0 minus z0 to the p and then take the limit, we get something that, we get a limit that exists and furthermore is not zero. All we're really doing here is clearing the fractions off on the series and taking the limit to get rid of everything after z0. And the reason I said these two things are intimately connected is that if you have a zero of order k for the function f, then it will be a pole of order k for 1 upon f. 1 upon, a pole of order, 1 upon a 0 of order k is a pole of order k, and conversely, in fact, 1 upon uh, a, zero, a pole of order p would give you uh, a 0 of order p. So uh, what we're now going to do is just a few brief examples, simple examples on finding zeros and poles. So in these first three examples, we're going to be looking at zeros z squared minus 1 has uh, zeros of order 1 at both plus and minus 1. We can see that because if we differentiate z squared minus 1, of course, we just get 2z. So although the function itself vanishes at z equals plus or minus 1, its derivative does not. So those are zeros of order 1, sometimes referred to as simple zeros. Sine pi z, well that also has simple zeros, uh, but it has simple zeros at every integer, because the derivative of sine pi z is pi times cos pi z, and we know that cos never vanishes where sine does, because sine squared plus cos squared is 1, so although sine vanishes at integer multiples of pi, cos does not. So once again, we get zeros of order 1. At every integer. All right, in this exa last example, we're looking at z cubed minus 1 cubed. Now we know where z cubed minus 1 has its zeros, they're at the cube roots of 1. Well, 1 is the obvious one, and the others are at e to the plus or minus 2 pi i on 3. When we cube the function, all we do is we just, in fact, multiply the order of the 0 by 3. 
If you think back to the de original definition in terms of series, that's quite obvious. In fact, in general, if you have uh, two functions that have a zero of order k at a point z0 and a zero of order l, you multiply them together and you get a function whose zero is of order k plus l. So here I'm just taking cubes, which is the same thing. So we will have for this function that has zeros of order 3 at z equals 1 and z is e to the plus or minus 2 pi i on 3. So there's three examples of zeros and how we manipulate them. What we're now going to do is to look at some examples where we've got poles. Okay, so now we've looked at zeros, we'll look at poles. My first example here, 1 over z squared minus 1. Well, we just found that z squared minus 1 had zeros of order 1 at plus or minus 1, taking 1 over it function, which means we're going to have poles of order 1, or simple poles, at z is plus or minus 1 again. So this has poles of order 1 at z is plus or minus 1. In the same vein, we had 1 over z cubed minus 1. Cubed, we found zeros of order 3 at the cube roots of 1. So 1 over z cubed minus 1 cubed will have poles of order 3 at all the cube roots of 1. So it has poles of order 3 at z equals 1 and z is e to the plus or minus 2 pi i upon 3. In this final example we see a situation where the poles and zeros partly cancel. You could think of a pole in fact as a zero, a pole of order p as a zero of order minus p and then you could just talk about adding zeros the same way I did when I was talking about previous example. If you take a function with a zero of order k and multiply it by a function that's got a, zero, a pole of order p at the same point, you will have a zero of order k minus p. Now if k is bigger than p, that will still be zero. If p is bigger than k, you'll get a pole left over. In this case, I've got sine pi z over z cubed minus 1. Now, we know that sine pi z has a zero of order 1 at z equals 1, and z cubed minus 1 cubed, we just pointed out, has a pole of order 3 there. So the product will have a pole of order 2 at z equals 1. But that the other singularities of this function will preserve the poles of order 3. So we've got different orders here. So this has a pole of order 2 at z equals 1 and poles of order 3 at the other cube roots, 2 pi i on 3. The other cube roots of 1, we have poles left over. 